Welcome to another video for IB Environmental Systems and Societies. Today's topic is 4.3 Aquatic Food Production Systems. The first big idea is that aquatic ecosystems are major sources of food for human populations. Demand for food from aquatic ecosystems is going to continue to increase as the human population increases and diets change. Just like we discussed in topic 4.2 about access to fresh water, as people become wealthier, their diet changes and shifts from a more plant-based diet to a protein-rich diet. And aquatic ecosystems can provide a lot of that protein. You should know that food webs in aquatic ecosystems begin with phytoplankton. There are two kinds of plankton in this world. There's phytoplankton and zooplankton. Phyto has to do with light. So phytoplankton are photosynthetic plankton, whereas zooplankton are consumers and they feed on the phytoplankton. And together they form the bottom trophic levels of aquatic ecosystems. It probably goes without saying that people get food from aquatic ecosystems by harvesting flora and fauna. Flora meaning plants, fauna meaning animals. The highest rates of productivity in aquatic ecosystems tend to happen along coastlines and in shallow seas. There are several reasons for this, which you should be able to outline on your exams. First, because of the global ocean conveyor system with all of the ocean currents, we tend to get upwellings of nutrient-rich water from deep in the oceans as those currents approach land masses. Shallow seas are more productive than deeper seas because the light penetrates the shallow seas, the water stays warmer, and those are ideal conditions for aquatic plant life or aquatic flora. Productivity is also high near coastlines because you have major rivers flowing into the ocean and those rivers have a lot of sediment and phosphates and nitrates and other nutrients from the land masses that they've been draining. So all of those nutrients flow into the ocean right there by the coast. It's usually quite shallow so the water is warmer. It's a great combination of abiotic factors to promote high levels of productivity. Remembering that this is an environmental systems and societies course, you should know that unsustainable use of aquatic food production systems can lead to their degradation and collapse. Changes in fishing equipment and fishing habits has led to dwindling fish stocks and damage to habitats. The graph you see here on the screen shows the amount of sustainable and unsustainable harvest globally in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The orange part of this graph represents unsustainable fishing where every year people are harvesting more fish than are produced. In ESS speak, what that means is the harvest of the natural income exceeds the growth produced by the natural capital. The wild fisheries are the natural capital. The new fish that are spawned every year is the natural income. And as long as we harvest fewer than the fish that are born every year, then we maintain those wild fisheries. But as you can see in the graph, that's not the case. It's gotten so extreme in some wild fisheries that they've actually collapsed, meaning those fish are on the verge of extinction or being wiped out to levels that are so low that they're no longer commercially viable. They're not worth the time, money, energy, and effort that it takes fishermen to find them and bring them to market. Another common theme you're gonna see in ESS is the idea of mitigation strategies. Mitigation means to reduce the impact of a problem. It means to make the problem less bad. You may be asked to evaluate strategies that can be used to avoid unsustainable fishing practices. So you'll wanna look at the pros, the cons, and then reach a conclusion about whether the pros outweigh the cons or vice versa. Like we have mitigation strategies for other environmental issues, we have mitigation strategies for the unsustainable harvesting of food resources from aquatic ecosystems. I'm not gonna go into those strategies in this video because there are too many of them to address and they're fairly complex. I might follow up with another video later on, but I suggest you go to my website and check out the links on this slide I'll include them in the description of the video, and you can investigate some of those strategies yourself. Some species that are harvested from aquatic ecosystems are fairly controversial in modern societies. The Inuit and other native cultures in the Americas have hunted whales and seals 
for many, many generations because it's how they can survive in such harsh environments in the polar climate zones where they live. Many other societies around the world disapprove of the harvesting of whales, either because they view the whales as emblematic, like a flagship species for the ocean, or for other reasons. Some countries, such as Iceland and Japan, continue to hunt whales for scientific research purposes. There is some controversy as to whether those purposes are genuinely scientific, or if the scientific research label is simply there to provide cover for other reasons. So far, everything we've talked about has been about wild fisheries. There's an alternative to wild fisheries, and it's called aquaculture. It's basically farming of creatures in aquatic ecosystems. Aquaculture has increased since the middle of the 20th century, largely as the result of a growing human population, as well as economic growth and development around the world. In this graph, you can see that since 1950, the annual fish catch per year has essentially quadrupled from 20 to 80 kilos per person per year. Have a look at the red line towards the bottom of the graph. See how it's growing exponentially at the right side? That's the aquaculture. So as the so as wild fisheries have begun to collapse and have been harvested unsustainably beyond the maximum sustainable yield, people are turning to aquaculture to meet that increasing demand because the supply in wild fisheries is decreasing while the demand is increasing. The only way to meet that demand is through the farming of species in aquatic ecosystems called aquaculture. If you look at this graph, you can see pretty clearly that it increases from left to right from 1950 to 2005. You should also notice that the top portion in green and teal that represents aquaculture is actually increasing as a proportion of the total harvest. So not only is the total harvest every year increasing, but the proportion of that harvest coming from aquaculture is also increasing. Some named examples to consider for aquaculture are farmed salmon. You'll find it's pretty easy to find quite a bit of information about farmed salmon in the media. You may also want to consider a country like India, which you can see here has both inland and marine aquaculture systems. Marine aquaculture systems allow the water and the nutrients and the dissolved oxygen to move more freely in and out of the pen while keeping the target species inside the pen and keeping predators and other species outside of the pen. Inland aquaculture is basically creating lakes or ponds that are confined and growing fish from hatchlings to harvest in those confined ponds. Some other named examples to keep in mind are a couple of the species that may be farmed as a part of an aquaculture system. Some other case studies or named examples to keep in mind when you sit your exams are some of the species you see on this graph. You'll notice at the top of the graph are the species that produce the most greenhouse gases per kilo of meat produced. Therefore, aquaculture of these species might result in increased greenhouse gases and greater climate change. The different color bar in the middle represents chicken, which is not aquaculture. It's just a terrestrial farming product that's there as a reference point. It's the most commonly farmed animal in the world. For every kilo of chicken that's produced, 8.3 kilos of greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. An aquaculture system focused on the species that produce fewer greenhouse gases than chicken may be considered ones that are beneficial for climate change because they are mitigating or reducing the greenhouse gases that we're emitting into the atmosphere from aquatic food production systems. There you have it. That's it for topic 4.3, aquatic food production systems. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like it. Consider subscribing to my channel. You can find more ESS materials at my website, www.mrcreamerscience.com. Thanks for watching and happy learning.